Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Harris, and today what we're going to do is look at capital budgeting projects using some capital budgeting tools. And you can see I have three projects. If you look up here, there's uh, Project 1, Project 2, Project 3, and we have different measures um, that we use for capital budgeting, including net present value, uh, profitability index, internal rate of return, and payback period. And you can see these three projects have different results using the different measures. And we want to understand this a little bit better. And let me just go through some of the key things here. We have an initial investment for each project here. You have 505000 you have a million one. 100,000, you have 840,000 for project three. And then we have all the incoming cash flows during a 10 year period for each project. So we can total those all up and get a present value using um, a net present value factor. Or as I did for project one out here, if we go into this, you can see the formula up here I used to calculate the present value of each each cash flow. In this case, we're taking the present value of this $300,000 at a 10% rate, which is what B3 is. That's B3 right here. And we're discounting that $300,000 to what it's worth today or in period zero. So in today's dollars, that's worth 272727 And we can do the same thing with each of the cash flows for each of the 10 years. For example, if we click on this one in year two, we're evaluating this $225,000, which was B8. And we're, again, taking our 10% discount rate, and we're using the value two years out. So that's our, our our discounted amount or our present value of that 225000 And then what we do is we simply add those all up and that gives us a present value for each of the 10 years incoming cash flows. To get net present value then what we do is we have to take out the initial investment. So we take if we go down to this one, we take B6, or, well, that's wrong. We take uh, B6 plus B17. You can see B6 is the initial investment, and it's negative. And B17 is the sum of all those cash flows discounted. So that gives us a net present value of 231148 and I'm not going to go through Project 2 and Project 3, but we did the exact same thing for, for those two projects. Then what we did is we found a pro profitability index, which is another measure we use in capital budgeting. And that's simply taking the net present value. Well, let's see what I did here. Okay, we took B17. So we took the present value divided by the initial investment. So that's, as long as that's better than one, that's, that's positive. So anything better than one we should accept because it's, it's a project that's going to make us money. This one here is called the internal rate of return or IRR. And what that is, it's the internal rate of return is simply the rate at which the present value of the cash flows equals zero. So it's an, it gives you, what we're doing is we're calculating the rate of return based on the present values of the cash flows. And so if we set the present value of the cash flows equal to zero, then we come up with a rate and that's our internal rate of return, which in this case is 29.74%. So that's internal rate of return. And the simplest one is called a payback period. And what we do here is we're looking to see how soon we get our $505,000 back in project one, for example. 
So if we go out one year, we still didn't get it. We still need, what, 205000 which is the difference between what we put out and what we got back. And it won't be till year two that we get that back. So if you look at the formula in here for um, payback, it's A7, which is one year, plus 205 to 25 which is the second year. So in other words, that's how far into the second year we have to go to get our $505,000 back. So it's 1.91 years. And again, I do the same thing for Project 2 and Project 3. Now you can notice that the cash flows are quite different on the three projects. For example, in Project 1 it's more spread out, but we get it we get more of the money back during the initial years than in the later years. As, as time goes on, we get less back. In Project 2, we get it back evenly for the first three years, and we don't get anything for a while until year 8, and then 8, 9, and 10, we start to get some big money back. That's probably a pretty unusual situation, but I'm just using this as an illustration so you can see how it all works. In Project 3, it's similar to Project 2. We get more money back, but not quite as much as in Project 2. And it's even for the first five years. And then we have period 6, 7, 8, and 9, where we have nothing. And then in year 10, we're getting a little bit back, because we're getting 100000 back. And then we can calculate our our net present value, our profitability index, internal rate of return and payback for that year as well, doing the same thing. Now notice how these are different. And the decision rules um, for um, net present value, well, let me back up. I want to cover two other things. I want to talk about um, decision rules. And decision rules are different depending on whether or not you have a, a mutually exclusive project. One project um, depends on another project or an independent project where the projects don't um, necessarily line up that way. You can, you can pick as many projects as you want. So notice if these are all independent projects you have different net present values and the best net present value is project 2 because you're going to get 361,000 versus 353,000 on project 3 or 231,000 on project 1. So in this case you would pick 361,000. Okay, so if these were um, mutually exclusive projects you would do this differently because then you have to look at um, which project is positive. And in this case, they're all positive, so you could accept them all. So as long as a project adds value, you would add it. And you use mutually exclusive and independent projects as part of your decision rules because as long as a project adds value to the firm you want to accept it except if it's a competing project it's a it's a project you want to compare with another project you have to pick the best one so that's why these two terms come into play and that's how the decision rules are different for net present value for profitability index, there's also decision rules. And instead of dollars, we're just using a ratio to evaluate the cash flows here. So as long as the profitability index is greater than one, you would accept a project if you're not looking at competing projects. If you're looking at competing projects, you want to pick the highest profitability index. So in this case, the highest profitability index is Project 1, 
and next would be project three, and last would be project two. So we're getting some competing, re, uh, some conflicting results between net present value and profitable profitability index, and that's because these things are relative. You know, for the amount that you've invested, you're getting the best bang for your buck with project one and the worst bang for your buck with project two. Okay, so that's that's another difference here. The next ratio we have, or not ratio measure we have, is the internal rate of return. And as I said earlier, that's where we're setting um, the present values of the cash flows equal to zero. And that's going to give us our internal rate of return, which we're going to compare against our discount rate, which is our cost of capital. And in this case, it's 10%. And so if these are not competing projects, we want to we want to pick the best internal rate of return. Again, that would be one. So those two measures pretty much coincide with one another, profitability index and internal rate of return. And you can see that over here too. So we have, we'd rank on internal rate of return and profitability index project one first, project two, project three second, and, and project two third. In both of those cases, profitability index and internal rate of return. If you have a competing project, what you have to do is compare. Um, Instead of accepting these all, you'd have to compare and say which one is going to be the best. And again, you would probably pick Project 1. Another measure is called the payback period. And that's a quick and dirty method, and it has a, a, a few flaws with it. And I showed you how that was calculated before. You want to know how, how soon you get this initial investment back. In this case, we had 505000 And the payback for Project 1 is 1.91 compared to 2.75 in Project 2 and 2.8 in Project 3. Again, we have some conflicting results because um, in this case, instead of Project 3 being ranked second, well, it's still ranked second. I take that back. But we have competing results again with net present value because um, in, in net present value, we had project two first, project three second, and project one third. So the, this one again coincides in this case with the profitability index and the internal rate of return. But it but keep in mind that what this this one does is it, it ignores totally what we did out here. It ignores the time value of money or what these cash flows are worth in terms of dollars today, which is time zero. So it totally ignores that. And therefore, it's a less uh, justified method. It also ignores all these cash flows after the payback. If you recall, we, we, we got our money back 1.9 years in. So we didn't even get to the end of year two before we got our money back. But it ignores all these cash flows um, from year three down to year 10, plus a part of, of year two. Totally ignored. And what do you see? Are those cash flows significant? Yeah, sure they are. And in some of these other ones, they're maybe even more significant. If you're looking at Project 2, you've got $750,000 in years 8, 9, and 10 coming in. So it's going to ignore all those cash flows. And that's why payback period is the least theoretically desirable measure. But it's a good quick and dirty measure if you just want to get a rough look at, at three projects and you can go back and then do net present value and profitability index and internal rate of return later. So that's how these work. 
Now notice also, I didn't talk too much about the discount rate. I think I mentioned that the discount rate is, is really the cost of capital, or really it's the weighted average cost of capital, because it's based on the mix of the cost of equity and the cost of debt. Now, what do you think happens when your cash flows come in later? Is that more or less risky? Yeah, if I'm getting this money 10 years out, maybe there's, you know, something that's going to happen that's going to prevent me to get from getting that $750,000 in 8, 9, and 10. So maybe I want to raise that discount rate to something. Let's just pick a number and say 14%. Okay, so if I put in 14%, how does that change my numbers? Okay, well, I think I had a higher internal rate of return and a higher profitability index and a higher everything when I had 10%. So it's going to lower um, my performance when I change. So one way a company a company can um, insert risk into the capital budgeting analysis is to raise the discount rate. And that's what I just did. So for for project two, which is probably more risky than project one because you're getting most of your money back sooner, it's reasonable to have a higher discount rate. And so that's what I did. And pro project three is probably more risky than one, but not as risky as two. So if I change that to, let's say, 12%, maybe that's a good way to evaluate it. And you'd have to decide how you get those risk premiums to get from 10 to 14 or from 10 to 12%. And there's different ideas you can use for that. So... That's basically um, ca how capital budgeting works and how the numbers are affected by these different ideas. I'll look forward to talking to you in the next video.